Uh, today we'll talk about parents, which is a new module in, in the Amsterdam Modeling Suite 2022. And this is a module that you can use to parameterize your XFF and DFTB, where DFTB is just a functional based type binding and, and ReXFF is a reactive function. So first I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what parents is, um, then why you'd be interested in using it. So what can you do with ReXFF and DFTB just to give you a few examples from our uh, tutorials. And then I'll show you a real life params uh, ReXFF example from industry uh, where, where params was used to, to solve a problem. And then I'll, I'll show you a bit about how parent works in, in practice, how you can add training data, what types of training data there can be, uh, how you set up the settings, how you look at the output. And I'll, I'll finish with some, some various features uh, just to, to briefly show you what's there. And then I'll end with a, with a summary. So, so uh, parents used to optimize ReXFF and DFTB. Or, or in particular, the GFN1 XTB Hamiltonian, uh, which is part of the GFTB engine inside the Amsterdam model. And this has been a collaboration with the professor at Juan Fesseralen at Gwent University in Belgium uh, and his student, uh, Leonid Komisarov. Uh, so this is one of several uh, academic collaborations that the CM has with uh, uh, academic research groups around the world. And if you want to use params, you need a, a license for the Advanced Workflows and Tools module, uh, which is a new module in, in Amsterdam Module Suite 2022. And params replaces the, the Amstrain module of previous AMS versions. So uh, Amstrain does not exist anymore. But parents is, I would say, significantly better than, than Amstrain was. And so we have uh, published uh, this work on, on params uh, in this paper. Uh, that was published last year. And there we explain more of the, the, yeah, the theoretical uh, underpinnings and, and exactly how the software itself works for uh, yeah, a scientific audience. Okay, so, so why should you use ReXFF and DFTB? And, and the short answer is that it's faster than DFT, where DFT is density functional theory. So here I have an example molecule. Uh, that I wanted to run and I ran it with uh, DFT. It took about 200 seconds, DFTB about two seconds, and ReXFF uh, about 0.1 seconds. And so because these uh, methods are, are much faster, it means that you can model larger systems or, or more systems. And there are of course many flavors of DFT. Uh, here I just chose a, a typical one. Some are more expensive, some are cheaper, but uh, you have a speed up of 100,000, 2,000 or so by running ReXFF or even a better speed up for larger systems. So why are VXFF and DFTB faster than DFT? And, and the answer is because they have parameters in them. And so here's an example. Uh, this is a ReXFF force field file. So if you, if you run a ReXFF simulation, you need to specify a force field file. And this is what that type of file looks like. It contains a lot of numbers, and these numbers are parameters that enter the ReXFF equations. And so what parent does, it helps you optimize these parameters. So to, to tell you what these numbers should be in order to get DFT quality results from ReXFF for your particular chemical system. Uh, so that's basically what, what parent does. It, it gives you those numbers. Now, now, what can you do with these numbers? So some examples that you can use ReXFF for, uh, or here, so, so this is an example of a voltage profile uh, during the lithiation of a, of a cathode material. Uh, so we have a tutorial for this explaining how you can do this. So you can do this both with molecular dynamics and with uh, Monte Carlo methods. Here's another example where you can analyze reactive molecular dynamics trajectories with chemtracer 2. So if you have a, you run a molecular dynamics simulation, uh, you can get a list of all the chemical reactions that occur, their weight orders and the weight constants. And you can also, in the graphical user interface, just uh, pick out the chemical reactions and, and see when they happen uh, very nicely. This ChemTracer 2 program is also part of this advanced workflows and tools in Amsterdam Modeling Suite 2022. A third example is, uh, so we have a lot of functionality for polymers. You can uh, construct these, these polymer structures. So this is a cross-linked polymer. 
with a certain cross-linking ratio. And then you can use RxVef to run long timescale dynamic simulations to look at, for example, the glass transition temperature uh, that we see. Or calculate other polymer properties like the uh, yield strength for the, the Young's modulus and so on. So those were three examples for RxFF, and then we have three examples for DFTB, and one is catalysis. So here, for example, you can look at uh, the homogeneous catalyst, uh, the Diglernata catalyst for, for polymerization. So we have a, a tutorial on that using DFTB. Uh, you can also uh, automatically discover various reaction pathways. So here, if um, so, this here is uh, pro protein and, and hydrogen chloride, and Using this module, you can ask the question, if I put this in a box, what will happen? And then you get the transition states and the minima. So this here is uh, two chloropropane, and this here is one chloropropane. And they have different barriers and different free limits. Uh, so this will be discussed more in depth in the, in the next seminar in, in two weeks. Final example is uh, to use DFTB for high throughput screening of different molecules, conformers, or, or materials. So here, here we have an example of a, of a Python workflow tutorial where you first calculate excitation energies and oscillator strengths with the time-dependent DFTB. And then you pick out the molecules that uh, have, the, have the best excitation energies and you then recompute them with a more accurate method. Um, so you, You start off with the time-dependent DFTB, and then at a later stage, you use time-dependent DFTB, which is more accurate. OK, so those were three examples for XFF, three examples for DFTB. Uh, and it's true that the Amsterdam modeling suite comes with many published reaction force fields and DFTB parameters. So chances are quite good that you can already model the system that you want to model. So these are all the reaction force fields that are included with with the Amsterdam modeling suite. So they work for a variety of chemical systems, uh, but not all chemical systems. So you'll often find, if you, if you try to use one of these force fields, that uh, they might not be accurate enough. And especially for these types of unseen structures or molecules that uh, were not part of the training set when the, these parameters were, were fitted. So here's an example from, from one of our industry customers. So uh, this is uh, lithium bisfluorosulfonyl uh, imide, or FSI. So it's lithium FSI in, in some organic solvent. And uh, this customer wanted to use uh, RxVef to, to look at uh, this salt in this salt. Uh, Matti, sorry to interrupt you. Can you go a little bit slower and closer to the microphone? There is a little okay. bit of problem in picking that up, sorry. So, so this uh, lithium FSI in this organic solvent, and you should expect to look at that. But, but if you run the simulation, what you see is that this anion, uh, so this is the anion, the FSI anion, dissociates, and this fluorine atom, so this is uh, a fluorine atom, uh, it moves to this and binds to this CH3 group of this ether molecule, which is um, quite unrealistic. Um, so yeah, and this can definitely happen. So this is uh, perfectly, perfectly fine, I would say, um, in the sense that the, the, the authors of the original RxVef paper did not consider this exact system. Uh, but you can easily build upon their work and, and refine the parameters with parents. So let's see how that works. Um, So here's a movie uh, where I force this molecule to dissociate. So I'm setting up what's called a, a PES scan or a bond scan in, in Amsterdam modeling suite. And I'm using this published reaction force field to look at how does the energy change uh, when this molecule dissociates. So now it's dissociating. Uh, and then you see that the energy goes down, which means that this the associated state is more stable than the, the intact state. Uh, but if you do the same calculation with DFT, and I'll show you the other side with DFT, then you see that the energy instead goes up when this molecule dissociates, and that's what you'd expect. Um, so yeah, it, 
one benefit with the, with the Amsterdam modeling suite is that you can set up this exact same calculation, both for the ReXFF and with DFT, and just compare the results one to one. So uh, in this, inside the same software, and the input is exactly identical. But okay, so the energy should go up when this molecule dissociates. So let's see if we can fix the ReXFF parameters uh, to make this happen. And so that's what I try to do. So to give you a feeling of the, of the effort involved here, so for this example, to set up new DFT calculations took about an hour. To run the DFT calculations took about another hour. Setting up the params input, uh, so that's settings for the params calculation and importing the, the DFT calculations into params took about 20 minutes. Re-optimizing the ReXMF parameters took about 10 seconds. Uh, I was a bit lucky, I must admit. Uh, so I, I started the parameterization, you know, running params. And then after the 10 seconds, because you get the graphs updated on the fly, I thought this looks good enough and I just stopped the parameterization. Um, and then to validate the, the force field took about an hour. So, so yeah, in under four hours, I had basically fixed this problem with this published reaction. And I could do this with zero lines of code. So, so every step along the way here is supported by the graphical user interface, which also makes it much uh, easier and, and faster to use. Uh, note, however, that if you want to use parent yourself, you will probably have to spend more time. So, so this was a very constrained problem or a very, let's say, reasonably easy problem to solve. And I have also developed parents, so I know exactly how to use it. Uh, but hopefully, so you know, we have many tutorials, and so if you use it, you will learn it, and then you can probably refit these types of uh, reaction force fields or so. Uh, so okay, I, I did this. I fit this new force field, and then what does the curve look like? Again, it's the exact same input, and then you see that now the energy goes up in about roughly the same way as it did for DFT. So this is the re-optimized, my version of the fourth field, and the uh, DFT curve looks like this. Yeah. So that's that's close enough in my book. Um, and so with this new fourth field, you can of course use it in production simulations. So here is uh, an, an example where, of the entire system where you have the lithium ions, you have the anions, you have the, the solvent, uh, run molecular dynamics, and you can calculate, for example, the diffusion coefficient, which relates to the conductivity. So the, the, the summary of this little um, exercise is that you can use params very easily and efficiently uh, together with the, the rest of the Amsterdam modeling suite for the DFT calculations to, to refit force fields. OK, so what is the general parents workflow? What do you need to do if you want to do what I did? So uh, ideally, you have an initial reaction force field or DFT B parameters if they exist. And as a first step, you would try to apply it to your problem and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, you might want to set up some new DFT calculations. Then you run the DFT calculations, you import the results into params, and you set up params. Then you run params, the params optimization. And in the end, you validate the new reaction force field by running some production simulation. And what you might find quite often is that uh, you need to make an, uh, some type of iterative improvements here. So when you when you validate the force field, you might find new problems with it. Then you need to set up new DFT calculations and, and so on. Um, until you, you have a reaccepted force field that, that works for your problem. So luckily, uh, all of these steps are supported by the graphical user interface. Uh, but yeah, you, you need some. You need to know how to set up a DFT calculation and how to run it uh, to be able to use this uh, effectively. So that can take some practice. So how, uh, in order to know what parents does or, or how to use it in the best way, you need to know what it does. Yeah. And what it tries to do is to minimize the loss function. And the loss function is this function um, on the uh, on the left, 
And on the right, you see a figure of the loss function versus the evaluation number. So for each new evaluation here, params will try a new set of parameters, a, a new combination of parameters, and evaluate the loss function. And the goal is to minimize the loss function to find the parameters that give the smallest value of this loss function. And that's, so parents is doing quite a good job in this case. You can see this loss function decreases, which is what you want it to have. Okay, so what is the loss function? Well, it's, it's some sum. Uh, and how many elements are in the sum? That's the training set size, that's its capital M. And for each training set entry, you have a, a weight, that's its W. You have the reference value. Uh, the predicted value is calculated by, by parents for you, so you don't have to input that one. And then you have the uh, the sigma, which is a type of unit normalization or accuracy. So the the W, uh, the Y, and the sigma here are all inputs for each training set entry. But the weight and the uh, the sigma they have some good default values. So you really only have to worry about this reference value, which comes from the DFT calculation or from some other method. And uh, Often you would use uh, some squared uh, error here, so it doesn't matter if you predict uh, too high error or a too, or a, if the reference value is too large or too small, uh, because you square it here. But if the reference value is exactly the predicted value, then the term will be zero, which is uh, what you want to. Do. Okay, so so all the magic really goes in this reference value. Here. So let's have a look at what types of reference values you can use in params. So the first type is um, anything that can be extracted from a job. So typically this might be forces or it might be charges that you can calculate with, uh, with some DFT method. So here if you have this uh, distorted uh, chloromethane structure, uh, the forces are, some forces are acting on the atoms and you can get them from a DFT calculation and use them as a uh, reference value. Or you can also calculate atomic charges if you want to be able to fit the, the charges. If you have a geometry optimization job, you can also extract uh, bond lengths or angles. So here we have an optimized chloromethane molecule, and then we have a bond length of 1.916 angstrom and an angle of 106.6 degrees. And this input you can also use uh, to, to train on, on optimized structures. And then we have test scans, and this is the, the energy versus some bond length angle or cell volume. So uh, in this case, we have a, a, our chloromethane molecule, and this angle is scanned, and then you look at the energy as a function of the angle, so that you can also input in the parents. And the fourth type is, is our values from multiple jobs, and these are typically then reaction energies, like adsorption energies, surface energies, formation energies. So here, for example, we have a, the combustion of, of propene in oxygen giving CO2 and H2O. It has some reaction enthalpy, and this you can also use as training uh, data. So actually, I think it's time to, to show you how that works. So I'll, I'll start up um, the parent's GUI and show you this in practice. Um, Yeah, let me also show this slide. So, so okay, th th this is just summarizes what, what I showed on the on the previous slide. So you have forces, tonic charges, optimized bond length angles, and pass counts, or reaction energies. So to, to make clear what this means, uh, you might have uh, one job here, and from it you can extract the charges. So we call this extractor in the, in the documentation. And then the reference value is also the charges. So it's just what you extract from the job where you can extract the forces and then the reference values to forces. So that's very nice and easy. Uh, but if you extract the energy, you typically wouldn't fit to the energy because the energy scale is different in React FF and DFT. Uh, instead, you want to fit relative energies or reaction energies. And those are the energies that matter in, in chemistry. So then if you have a second job, you can extract the energy from that job and then you can combine these energies somehow, for example, subtract one from the other and that gives you them this, this reaction. So I'll show you that uh, as well. 
So let's begin. Uh, I have prepared some uh, examples here. So for example, uh, if you set up a DFT calculation, you run a single point on some structure like this. I do it with ADF, which is our molecular DFT engine. Um, you can run it. And if you then select the job and you import this into params, uh, I will close this window because I'll show you that later. Start up a new window. There we go. So this is what the parent GUI looks like when you when you start it up. Um, and by default, you fit the Leonard Jones engine, uh, but you can also fit uh, ReXFF or this DFTB method, GFM1 XTB. So if I do job add to params, I get a dialogue uh, asking me what I want to import. So maybe I want to import the charges. Then I click import. And then you can see the structure, this distorted chloromethane structure. Um, and I've then added a job, which is a single point job on the structure. I've added some uh, reference value, which are the, the charges. And if I go to the info panel, I can see these values. So these are the atomic charges on the five atoms here. And if you want to know what they are, uh, we can name them. So this font is, is very small, but this carbon is the first atom, this chlorine is the second atom, and then we have hydrogen. Atom. So this would be the uh, carbon, chlorine, and so on. Those are easy to import. And then if you want to add more training data, so for example, now we want to add the forces, uh, I can just choose training set, add forces. And that will then show you the, the forces here. So these are, Every atom, so there are five atoms on five lines, and they have forces in the x, y, and z directions. Uh, so that's what you see. And then you can train to, to these forces. If you have an optimized structure, so if you set up a, a geometry optimization job in ADF, and you optimize it, um, the structure becomes optimized. And you can then import this job into parents. You get the dialog, and you can then select you want to run a geom optimization in the parameterization. Uh, and let's import that. We then get the optimized structure, and we can then add some geometry information, like for example, this bond length. If I do training set add bonds, now I added this carbon chlorine distance, which is 1.9 angstrom. Or I can add an angle, I can add this angle. I can do training sets, add angles. And the angle is 106.6 degrees. If I have a, a bond scan or a lattice scan, so maybe I'll show you this uh, lattice scan. So this is our periodic DFT code band. And I can set up a, what, a PES scan. And on the PES scan panel, uh, I can choose to scale this volume uh, in some range. So the result of such a calculation would look like this. So this is now the diamond structure and the, the DFT energy as a function of the volume. Okay, so I can just import that nice and easy uh, into parents. Uh, and I can import it as a pest scan and click import. And then this uh, relative energies are shown uh, down here. So the first point is 90.4 kcal per mole higher than the minimum energy. That's what we, if I go back to this movie, I can make this point a little clearer. Uh, so you can graph the relative energy. Uh, 
And then we see here that the minimum is, is 90 kcal per mole lower than the first point. Or the first point is 90.4 kcal per mole higher than the, the fourth point. So I have imported these relative energies along this scan coordinate into parallels. Finally, then uh, reaction energies. So here I have geomer optimization for propene, water, O2, and CO2. And I can import all of these at the same time um, by doing job at the params. I can run them as uh, single point or geometry optimizations. Let's do geometry optimization. I can import all of those. And then we see, okay, we have the structures for propene, water, O2, and CO2. And now if I want to import the reaction energy, uh, you would, for example, then do training set, add energy. I double click in this, uh, in this details code. So now I get the energy of this CO2 molecule, but that's not what I want. I want this reaction energy, the, the combustion of protein. So I will try to edit this. Uh, so if I do energy of the CO2 plus the energy of the water, those are the products. And if I subtract, and I'm going to do 1.0 times the energy of propene and the energy of O2. So this would be propene plus O2 becomes CO2 plus water. But then I also have to uh, balance this equation. So then I just click the balance button, and that will retain this 1.0 and modify the coefficients of the others. So then I see I get three CO2 plus three water minus propene minus 4.5 O2. So that's the balanced equation. Uh, and this reference value is now not yet updated, so I need to update that. Uh, and now we have the, the updated reaction energy, which is 358.8 kcal per mole for this reaction. Okay. So those are, are the types, the, the, really the four main types of reference data that you'd want to, to use. And, and we have tutorials explaining precisely how you can encode. So if you didn't follow exactly what I did, you can rewind the video or, or look at the tutorials or ask in the discussion. So I showed you the charges forces, the optimized bone lengths and angles, Bone scan, angle scan, lattice scan. I showed you the lattice scan, but it's the same for a bone scan or an angle scan. And the reaction energy, which is this uh, reaction here. And it automatically balances the stoichiometric coefficients. Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the reference data. And then the next part is the parameters. And which parameters to optimize. So, so ReXF has many parameters and we have divided them into some categories uh, where we have a category called standard, which would be uh, the parameters that you're most likely to want to optimize. Um, we also in general recommend to choose as few parameters as possible because that will make the problem a lot easier. Uh, so uh, if possible, you try to start from a previous ReXF force field that uh, works for something and then you just fine-tune it a little and not completely from scratch. And if a parameter value is close to the minimum or maximum allowed value, you can change the range and, and continue. And then you also need to decide which optimization algorithm to use. So that's the algorithm that, that you use to minimize the loss function. And we then recommend CMAES for most optimization problems. So that's the covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy. And uh, we have a, a video on YouTube that explains this algorithm in, in some detail. Um, we have, have um, a parent challenge going on at the moment that you are, are very welcome to join, where the challenge is that you fit and submit a ReXF force field. And there are hundreds of viewers in, in prizes. And some reasonable input has already been prepared by me. So you can just open the files and run it. And you'll get a force field file and, uh, that you can submit. Uh, or you can try to adjust some settings to get an even better force field. And uh, yeah, the deadline is the 1st of July. And there's a, a link here with some 
with the rules and, and the files you need to download to, to be able to. So I'll, I'll show you what that looks like as a concrete example of what params might actually look like in practice and also to see what the output might look like. Um, so I'll open parents here. Yeah, so, so uh, this is now a, a run that I finished with the default settings, and this is ReXFF. Uh, so we have uh, a bunch of charges in the training set, some energies, which are reaction energies of various sorts. We have some atomic forces. We have angles for optimized structures, uh, distances, and these types of bond scans uh, as well. So that's a, a variety of jobs. Uh, and what you see, if you, if you run parent, you will get graphs, and these graphs will automatically update, even if you're running on a remote machine. So here, for example, I, I now finished this run because it takes, it takes a while to run it. But for example, you get the loss function here, which decreases as it should. Uh, here we have the root mean squared error of the predicted charges as a function of evaluation. And we have a, a scatter plot of the predicted angles versus the reference angles. And you can uh, choose many different plots. So you can also plot, for example, these uh, bond scans. So here we have a methylvinyl ether, a bond scan between a, a carbon and uh, an oxygen. And you see the reference is the blue curve. The x-axis is the is the length is this bond length. Y-axis is energy. Blue curve is reference. Red curve is prediction. So here, okay, it's not great. It's not perfect. Uh, this bone scan looks a bit better for this allyl alcohol. So, so yeah, uh, how, how well you perform depends on the structure and, and the parameters that you optimize and many different factors. So you can view the pest scans like this in the, in the graphical user interface. You can switch to, now we get a scatter plot of predicted versus reference distances instead. And there are, are many different plots and tables that you can show as a result. Uh, so yeah, I, I encourage you, if you have uh, parents or if you want to access parents, um, you should participate in this, in this challenge to get to know the graphical user interface a bit and what it looks like when you run it, the results you get and so on. I'll also just briefly mention these parameters. So ReXFF has many parameters and they come in different blocks. So there's a general block, GEM. And then there's an atomic block. So each element here, we have carbon, for example, has some parameters. Hydrogen has some parameters, oxygen, nitrogen. And then we have bond parameters, B and D. So that's between carbon and carbon. Between carbon and hydrogen, you have some parameters. Between hydrogen and hydrogen, you have some parameters and so on. And then you have angles, you have off-diagonal terms and, and torsions. And uh, yeah. You, if you want to inside parents, you can create a force field from scratch, or you can load uh, one of the force fields that already come with the parents or with uh, the Amsterdam models. So that's usually a good starting point. And then you would say, okay, I want to optimize this parameter. And then you tick this active checkbox, which means it will be optimized. And you can see its current value and the range of allowed values. So uh, this parameter will never be smaller than 0.66 and never larger than 1.11. And for each parameter, you also get a small uh, description of what it is. Yeah, so this has to do with sigma bond covalent radius. And you also get an equation number. If you really want to know exactly what this parameter does, you can look it up in the documentation. And as I said, we have these categories as well. So uh, in this, um, now I only show the active parameters. And so in this challenge, uh, you mostly optimize standard parameters for some of the elements, uh, but also a few what we call expert parameters that you can enable or disable if you, if you want. So that's what the graph user interface looks like. You run it and then you get these uh, types of graphs and tables and text files as well. 
All right, I hope that looks at least reasonably exciting. Uh, so that's the parent challenge. Feel free to, to give it a go and, and submit your force field with a chance to, to win some, some money. Okay, I, I will now finish by rattling off 12 bonus features that I haven't mentioned yet, but that you might find interesting. Um, so number one is validation sets. So uh, you can use both training sets and validation sets. And if you're familiar with uh, machine learning, you know validation sets are very important in that area when you do parameter fitting. But it's also good and useful for ReXFF or, or DFTB parameterization. So the validation set is just like a training set, only you don't use it to evaluate the loss function for the training. You just evaluate the loss function anyway uh, without really using the information. And then the goal is to, to get the validation set error also decreasing uh, to know that you're not overfitting. And we have feature number two is you can restart optimizations or continue from where you left off. If they are interrupted uh, for any reason, you can just continue where you almost exactly where you left off. Uh, number three is the params Python library. So we have uh, a great Python library that you can use and that's also very uh, useful if you if you're a bit more experienced. You can do some things faster in the, and easier in the Python library uh, than in the graphical user interface if you know what to type. So, uh, but yeah, so you can do everything inside the Python library as well. You can you can construct a training set, you can run the optimization, uh, you can plot the results and so on. Number four is experimental reference data. So you don't need to get your reference data from DFT calculations, uh, but you can just put in structures uh, and then any reaction energy you want, for example, you can just type in the number and, and use that. So it can come from experiment or from any other source. Number five, you can import uh, VASP or quantum espresso calculations. So VASP, for example, you get an outcar file. You can just import this outcar file and you will get the structure, the energy, the forces, and the stress tensor. And similarly for, for quantum espresso. And number six is we have uh, 14 GUI and Python tutorials. So we have lots and lots of materials uh, for you to go through in order to really learn how to how to use this software. Uh, so, you know, I, I showed you the GUI now, but that's not really enough to uh, appreciate exactly what you need to do to, to get everything working. Number seven, you can work in your preferred units. Uh, so if you like to work in kcalc mole, you can work in kcalc mole. If you prefer electron volts, so I like to work in electron volts, and then I select electron volts. Uh, no problem. Number eight, you can modify job settings with ARMS input. Uh, so for example, if you parameterize DFTB and you do periodic DFTB calculations, uh, you might want to choose different case-based samplings for different jobs, uh, or you might want to change the maximum number of geometry, geometry optimization iterations. Uh, and you can do that in ARMS input and you can just pass it to params and it will, it will pick it. And number nine is the human readable input in YAML format. So all the, uh, all the input, everything we saw in the graphical user interface will be stored in this type of text input that you can just open in a text editor and look at or change if you want to. Number 10 is human readable output that you can import directly to Excel or GNUplot or, or any plotting program. Um, so you, for example, for a bond scan here, you will get this text file containing the distance uh, the reference values, the prediction values, and then you can import them into Excel, for example. Number 11 is you can convert from the old ReXFF training format to, to params. So, and you just open the file in the graphical user interface. So in, in previous AMS versions, uh, we use this file called geo and, and F field and trainset.in. Uh, you can just open those files and they will be converted to the new form. And number 12 is you can recalculate trajectories with a different method. So if you have, uh, for example, you have run ReXFF uh, 
and molecular dynamic simulation, you get some frames and you want to recalculate these frames with DFT, you know, to check if you're correct or not. We have a new task in, in the in the arms driver for this called the uh, replay. So you just select the, the file and the frames you want to calculate, and then you can calculate them with DFT, either to compare the results or to just import it as new reference data into Parallel. So finally, some, some outlook then, we're, we're still developing this. So, so uh, we're making some improvements to the input to the graphical user interface. And we're also working on running multiple optimizations at the same time with a package called uh, Glompo, which is also developed by, by Fristral and, and one of his students. Uh, yeah. Okay, so to summarize, uh, params and amps make it easy to create and validate we accept the force fields and DFTB parameters. And when I say DFTB, I really mean GFN1 XTB. And when I say easy, I mean reasonably easy. Uh, you can train to reaction energies, forces, charges, bond scans. Uh, you get results. They are shown in many different graphs and tables. You can, they are updated on the fly as the parameterization progresses, even if you run on a remote machine. You can use uh, ARMS to address your research problems. I showed you many applications with the um, voltage profiles or the, the excitation energies and so on. And uh, yeah, if you want to, you can participate in the, in the parents uh, challenge to get to know the graphical user interface. And uh, that's the end. So uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, Mati. Um, maybe we can start off already with a few questions. So um, yeah, there were a few sound problems. Um, I hope they gotten better. Uh, we didn't we didn't check properly for the the echo when we're testing this. I'm sorry about that, but in either case, you uh, should be able to review the recording um, okay. to uh, in a few days. To, we will put that on our YouTube channel, and you should be able to to read that or to review that with subtitles. Um, yeah. So there was then a question. Uh, Starting off with that, can one easily import energy differences from the literature or other QM codes to perhaps? Yes, yes. So, so that was this uh, experimental reference data. Uh, so if you import from other, uh, right, so this would be experimental structures uh, and energies, reaction energies, or you can import from VASP and Quantum Espresso, then you just need the, the output from these codes. Uh, if you have even uh, or other DFT codes uh, that are not VASP, Quantum Express, or AMS, then you have to sort of treat it like an experimental reference. So, so you you import the structures and then you try to to manually input the reference values, either the energies or or the forces or, or yeah that you can do. But it will it will not be automatic if it's not AMS, VASP, or, or Quantum. Um, and then just something which is a typical question, um, and it was also, I think, addressed in Adri's talk a little bit. Um, so usually you are uh, taking differences between different systems as reference. Uh, could you comment on that, why that is so, and why you have to do that? Yes, for the energies, uh, you often do that, and that is because ReXFF um, has a different absolute energy scale compared to, to DFT. And even within DFT, you have different absolute energy scales between different codes. So if you do a, 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 an ADF calculation, you will get one energy. But if you use, uh, for example, Gaussian or Orca, you will get a different energy. And so these, these energy points that you get out are not always physically meaningful. It's really only energy differences that are, are meaningful. Right, so there's always an offset in this series. One tends to forget that, but uh, usually absolute energies are meaningless unless you have something to reference them to. Exactly. I, I will say though that if you uh, if you have a method that can can uh, that has an internal energy offset that you can tune, like for example, most machine learning potentials. Then you can train directly to the to the energy as long as you use only one you know DFT code for the energies. Exactly. Uh, then again, you just have trained to one functional and to one method, right? Exactly. That's 
Um, next question. So from uh, Xing Yu. So is charge equilibration performed during the parameter training for ReXFF? That's a very good one. Yes. So uh, when you parameterize ReXFF, you're, you're running ReXFF. You know, you're running these single point sort of geometry optimizations. And internally, then you will also do the charge equilibration. So, so that, that will happen. And you can also optimize the parameters for the charge equilibration, of course, the, the eta and the hardness, or well, the electronic negativity and hardness, and this gamma uh, parameter as well. Indeed. So you have to, to consider the model you are optimizing like a black box where you just fit, fit in some input coordinates and uh, the parameters, of course, you try to optimize. And within this black box, uh, the model will do everything itself. So, and, uh, of course, for ReXFF, this charge equilibration is part of the program, so that will happen. And I think even if you would, there is no way to, to alter this, right? Uh, you can, uh, maybe we have an input option to turn off charge equilibration. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's one of the more expensive parts of running ReXFF. So maybe that's why this calculation uh, or this question popped up, right? So, so you're, you, maybe you don't want to spend time in charge equilibration, uh, especially if you have the same uh, same structures all the time, then, and the same, uh, if you're not optimizing the charge equilibration parameters, then you will get the same charges all the time. So in that sense, you're not, by performing the charge equilibration every time, you're doing some unnecessary work. I think. That, that used to be possible to switch that off. Uh, I remember that that was done in this cobalt training set because that indeed, like Mati said, was just one element and uh, different structures, faces, and so on. And uh, there was no charge equilibration. But that was uh, in the ReXFF classic. I would expect this to be possible in our ReXFF too. Yes, yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm not sure if it's how easy or difficult it is to turn. Uh, that feature. Good. Um, something more practical, technical. Um, is it possible to use the charts and the analysis from the graphical user interface? And uh, can you do that uh, if the parameterization is started via Python shell? So, and how would you approach that? Uh, if you start via the, the Python shell, can you use the charts and the all the graphical data or the plot data, basically? Uh, almost. So, so uh, you you will need to to trick uh, the graphical user interface into believing that you have run it via the graphical user interface. Uh, so this is a feature that we should probably implement. But if you if you move the files around so that they uh, or as if they have been written by the graphical user interface. So the graphical user interface requires the, uh, you know, the, the input files to be in a dot parent directory and the results file to be in a dot results directory. Um, then you can open it up in the graphical user interface. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if the question was about the graphical user interface, it was more whether you can get the data. Um, so is it, would it be possible to, to get, get a CSV file for that or so? You will get it. It will. Uh, you will get it automatically. So this this file here, for example, for the for the Pascal or the the correlation plot, the scatter plots as well. You will get text output written directly in the folder, and you can just do what you want. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of where it ran in within Python or GUI. Exactly. It's the same. It's the same thing producing the output. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. That was answered. Good. Perfect. Um, can you uh, switch to slide 30? There was a question from Ted about that. 3-0. 3 yes. So that was here. And the question is, um, slide 30 showed only four standard parameters. I assume that reaction enthalpies, bond lengths, angles, dihedral angles, uh, although not listed, are also standard parameters. Please confirm. Indeed. So uh, in the... Um... Uh, this is what it looks like more typically, right? So um, if I show all the parameters, 
then you can see you have standard parameters also uh, for the angles and for the torsions and the hydrogen bonds. So, so all of this did not fit fit on the slide. That's the reason it was. Okay, then a question about um, older versions. So AMS uh, 2019. Um, so Viper AMS is very con uh, convenient. Um, GAN has just uh, is working still with an older version. Um, can he still do something? Uh, is it possible to develop some force field with AMS 2019? And how would yes. you construct the training set in such a case? Yeah, so, so then you would need to go to the older tutorials, uh, and we have a few tutorials on, on that as well. Then you can use this Amstrain module, which is the, the, the previous version. Uh, I think Amstrain was in, in uh, Amst 2019 as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would just refer to the old tutorials in that case. Uh, it, will, uh, it will not be as easy as it is in, in 2022. Uh, so, so if it's possible to upgrade, I would I would recommend an upgrade if you want to make React FF4. Yeah, so indeed, you guys put a lot of work and effort in making this as smooth and as uh, canned as possible. So um, yeah. yeah, that partially is the value which we why we are feeling confident to release new versions and to sell them. Um, yeah, so uh, if Jenny asks, uh, if I want to add a new element to my force field, which is not included in the default ReXFF database, yeah. which atomic parameters should I parameterize and which one sh uh, sh I shouldn't touch? So uh, valence, radius, EM charges, etc. As I understand, um, I can take atomic parameters from a similar element and change mass and valency. Yeah, that is a good starting point indeed. Uh, could you comment further? Yes, well, well, uh, I don't have too many other comments other than if you if you want to optimize uh, parameters, um, then indeed copy a similar chemical element. And I think most chemical elements are, are, are covered already, maybe not the most exotic uh, actinide, for example. There may not be too many forces there. Uh, but then just copy a, a similar element. I don't think the mass is even used uh, by AMS. So, so you can change it for consistency, but it, it will not matter. Um, so the mass in the force, there is a mass parameter in the force field. And yes, there, there is. AMS ignores it, I guess. That was for legacy ReXFF code. Yes, I, I, I don't. I think we may not even show it in the graphical user interface here. Is that correct? So we're hiding some of these that are really not used at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are some parameters that we do not show because they're they're not used. Yeah, but indeed, um, I have seen uh, also ex other experts doing this that uh, really you take something which is close in the periodic table to the element you're interested in yeah. of close as, as close as possible of course and then um, yeah you start probably with a few simple parameters and uh, element specific ones and then until you then uh, uh, resort to optimizing entire groups say bond related parameters and the like um, so uh, next question is actually two. So in some uh, published force fields, I've seen one ty atom type named X. What does that mean? And scroll up here. Uh, what is the difference between W and Sigma in the error function? As far as I know, in previous versions, only uh, Sigma existed and it was 0.1 for bonds as default, for instance. Yeah, okay, so, so the X, I'm not sure what the meaning of X is actually. Uh, I think it's supposed to be some type of dummy element that you can, if you want to insert some dummy atom. Uh, but I'm not sure why, what this is used for. Maybe Ole knows or Thomas knows. No, I also don't know. Um, I, I don't think, I'm not sure it actually serves the purpose. Um, it, it happens in these force fields that that there are also say other elements 
inside the force field that the force field has not been trained with. Um, yeah, this is a bit of like what we sometimes call uh, force field hygiene. <laughs> sometimes uh, there are leftovers in, in published force field, and I think this Indeed. is uh, one of such. Uh, yeah, such so it, it, uh, I would also say the parameterization of these force fields, um, while it is very clean and params, um, let's say when it's really done by, by experts or so, from, for example, by address group, uh, it may not always be as clean as possible. The result is, of course, uh, as, good as, as good as it gets, but uh, the procedure itself can be a bit messy and there's some legacy eventually. And the X then I would, for example, just simply, uh, so far when I was working on Ring Surfer, I always considered that as a placeholder uh, of no further use, at least for the purposes I was using the force field for. Okay, yeah, so I, I think the conclusion is uh, we, we don't really know what the, what the X is. Uh, yeah. And then so, there was the question about this weight and the, and the sigma. Exactly. And uh, that's a good question. In fact, we have a, a rather lengthy paragraph in the documentation explaining the difference between weight and sigma, and or how we approach weight and sigma. So it's completely correct that in the previous uh, ReXFF versions, there was only the sigma, and you would need to, to specify it. Uh, but the, the problem with that is that it's, um, It's difficult to 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 intuit the the meaning really because it's also squared. So, so one could look at it as some type of accuracy. So if you would say, "Oh, can I accept an error of 0 0.1 angstrom in my bond length?" I would put sigma to 0 0.1, and that's fine. Uh, but then, if you want to make it twice as important, this entry, uh, you have to think more, and that's what we try to to. Uh, avoid we, we don't want to think we just want to want to do so the weight is really if the weight is two the entry is twice as important as if the weight is one and if the weight is a thousand it's a thousand times more important and the sigma we use we look at it more as to to normalize different units so it doesn't matter if you express your unit your energy right so let's say the reference value up here uh, and the predicted value are expressed in, in, in electron volts. Uh, well, this energy difference will be something, but if it's expressed in, in uh, take out a mole, it will be 20 times larger. And so this sigma also has that same unit and, and it acts to cancel out the effect of which unit is used to express this thing. Uh, that's the main purpose of the of the signal, but you can still look at it as a type of accuracy or, or an acceptable prediction error if you. If you yes, yeah, so it's more a practical distinction, right? So one is, is more indeed the metric for the unit you're using in order to be able to train uh, things like energies and bond lengths or so yeah. at the same time. And the weight is more uh, specific to the training example that you can uh, Way put under different weights for for different examples. Right? Exactly. So, so because I mean you can input, I mean, you input both this number and this number. So so and of course, if you choose this to be something, you can set this one to be something else to to cancel the change out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Dong Ming asks, uh, Adri recommended uh, to train charge and forces and then PS energies. Uh, does putting all training data work well? Um, so you probably mean uh, optimizing all the training data at once? Um, I so, think so there's, maybe I can answer this. Um, there is a reason why Adri recommends doing this in batches and that is because the model itself is very highly dimensional and very complicated and there are all kinds of different dependencies. Um, so the optimization problem will get much, much easier and your optimization is much more likely to, to succeed if you optimize them in groups, one group after another, and then cycle through this. So, uh, I will also say that the, the charges, those are related to the to this electronegativity equalization parameters and, and the energies are very sensitive to those. Um, so, so if you're optimizing the charges, it makes sense to optimize those parameters, but but yeah, everything will depend very heavily on what those EEM parameters are. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, also uh, the the um, the optimization algorithm that was used on a, on a lot of, especially of the old force fields out there. Um, um, the single parameter search is like almost like a successive one parameter search. It's not in a way as as global as the optimization algorithm that we are using. Um, so the CMA optimizer is really a global optimization approach and um, this uh, parameter search that was employed in a lot of the older force fields was not really or only half or however you look at it. So there's like an attempt to break the, the dimensionality of the problem a bit down and uh, there might not really be any need for this anymore with the new powerful optimization algorithms. Mm, well. I think there there might still be a, a need. Uh, so so uh, yeah, especially these EEM parameters. Uh, mm. yeah. I would also agree. Like the uh, RxFF can be pretty complicated internally. Also, dependency between different groups of parameters. Also, so you want to separate that out in most cases as much as possible. For yeah. Well, you know. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's worth a try. Um, I'd say, but uh, the good thing is, uh, it's, it's not really much work to, to like exactly. try and see what happens uh, mm -hmm. with params. Uh, it used to be a lot more work before. Um, yeah, so just try both ways and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so that's true in general that you have to, to try a lot of things before it works out. So then uh, Luis was asking if there are any plans for params to uh, extend an existing DFTB parameter set to include a new element, uh, let's say uh, PBC03 from DFTB plus uh, and to add germanium, for example, to it. Uh, no. So that is, uh, that's part of the, the uh, slated cost type DFTB. And uh, Currently, we, we do not have plans to, to, to let you parameterize new elements for that. Uh, because so, that would involve generating new slated cost of tables, uh, which is a bit more, more complicated than that. Is there any specific reason for that, or is this just because the slated cost of type data sets are so large? Uh, there's no reason other than that we don't have the functionality and instead you can parameterize this GFNXDB hematomony, which already includes all the chemical elements. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, that's really the only, only reason. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then a question from Ape. Uh, I need to reparameterize mm -hmm. a force field for use with the molecule gun at higher energies. Is it possible to use analytical solutions for the potential for training if there is no experimental data? Or is it possible to use DFT to generate this data and the projectile energy will be up to 200 kilo electron volt? Um, so maybe Ola has the most experience with that stuff. So maybe you can start. Uh, sorry, can you can you repeat? I apparently have some sort of delay on my... Uh... Oh. Okay, so it is that about, I was looking into. It is about reparameterizing mm -hmm. a force field uh, to be used with the molecule gun at higher energies, so up to 200 kilo electron volt. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a lot. Um, yeah, for that you need to refit inner wall shieldings. And um, there are uh, force fields, there's, there's one force field, uh, you can find that if you look into our online force field reference that was used um, for uh, um, noble gas uh, irradiation of the graphene sheet, I think it was. And in that force field, there are inner wall shieldings used. So if you just open that force field up, you will see, um, uh, yeah, you basically see which parameters has been set that haven't been set in other force fields. There will be one way to see it. Um, or you, yeah, you use elements from that force field and adjust them like what we discussed before. Um, if that is possible for you, I'm not sure what the projectile is supposed to be in the current case or in your use case. Um, 
but uh, th that would be a good starting point, I think. To look so, into that and thing. where would you take the reference? I think that is more mainly what the question is about. Where would you take the reference data for such inner you know, wall shieldings? D DFT calculations. Okay. Yeah, so I, really... I run DFT calculations. Um, I don't exactly recall what settings I, I used. But those are then basically two atoms closer and closer together until you get an idea of how uh, this. Uh, yeah, so you you are you're running a path scan and uh, you scan them very very close to each other, say um, yeah, as as close as you as you possibly can, and uh, as you can get away with. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you will see that the energy goes up like crazy as expected. And, and that's exactly the kind of, of range that you're interested in for fitting these inner wall shieldings. Mm -hmm. And fitting them was uh, quite a, quite an easy task. So um, a bit like in line with what Mati showed, you know, when you say, I think that's good enough, it's, it's pretty fast. You know, if, if you see the, the potential energy going through the roof, you know, that's what you want to see if two atoms get really, really close to each other and you will see that pretty fast. And uh, in that particular case, there was a surface sputtering force field I made. Um, I also found that all sorts of secondary collisions were of importance too. So don't only fit um, shieldings and, uh, and parameters related to the projectile and the surface, but also between all the surface atoms. Mm -hmm. Basically, every every everything inside the system. If you shoot a projectile with several hundred kilo electron volts into into a surface, then yeah. uh, things will go bananas, and that it's everybody against everybody. Yeah. That is then probably would have this melting cone already behind the, the impact point. Yeah. That. Um, so the next so um, I, I just yeah. wanted to to add something there. So if you have the analytical potential. Uh, you can add any reference data you want. So, so uh, if you already know what this curve looks like, then just put in the numbers and, and don't run the DFT calculation, basically. So, yeah. yeah. Um, then a question from Jordi. That's also a good one. So at the time to do an initial force field guess for a reactive F force field development, if there are some previously developed force fields for some atoms of your system, is there any proper tool or proper manner to add and mix them for your initial gas force field? I assume you're referring to merging two different force fields and use them as initial gas? Definitely. So we, we have this exact feature described in, in a tutorial for zinc sulfide where uh, there, there is no zinc sulfide force field that we include, but the tutorial shows you well, you take, you know, there, there's a zinc oxide force field, so you take sort of zinc oxide, but then you turn oxygen into sulfur and then you mix it with some organic force field from, from uh, a different force field and then you have your, your initial gas. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, check out the, the tutorial for that. Yeah, so indeed, uh, this seems to also become more and more popular to do this as uh, with increasing size of the RxFF community. So, uh, yeah. while in the beginning you had all this dependency threes for for the different force field families, or so now different branches start to be merged, or get getting merged again with yeah. one another. Um, so indeed, and yeah. Kind well, of yeah. check, check I will say though that yeah, if you're if you're academic and you do this, you need to of course cite the original uh, yeah. papers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then there was a comment from Mabub actually. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I saw that too late. So uh, the X in the ReactFF force field is typically a dummy parameter. Sometimes it is used for uh, bond restraint calculations, and it doesn't have any bonded parameters. So yeah, thank you very much for that comment. Um, uh, then another question from Evgeny. Um, is it possible that some parameters are impossible to optimize? I've noticed in Amstrain that when I try to parameterize a platinum aluminum oxide system, I couldn't add uh, platinum aluminum bond parameters to the params file. If I added these parameters by hand, they disappeared from params from the params file after saving with arms train. However, adding these parameters improved the force field significantly. Yeah, I, um, that sounds like a bug. Sounds like it shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like 
I, I would encourage you to to use params instead of arm strain. Uh, yeah, so maybe I don't it's think good. people have that, that problem. Yeah, so maybe it's a good idea to, if, if you have that available, to uh, use the new version or params for that manner and uh, try that again. And if that doesn't work, uh, of course, feel free to uh, contact our technical support because that then looks like a bug. Uh, that being said, though, there are some uh, parameters in the list uh, which, which are denoted as do not optimize. Uh, maybe you can comment on that while we're at that topic. Yeah, so that's, for example, the, the atomic valence. Uh, or yeah, let's see what these parameters are. Right, so the valency of carbon is four. Uh, that's not a, a number to, to optimize. There are also certain things like the global taper radius. So this is the global uh, global cutoff radius for the for the interactions, which is usually ten angstrom. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is and this is a parameter you can change. You can change this to twelve if you want to. That's fine. Uh, but you don't want to optimize it uh, because it's, it's really, yeah, it's not a parameter you want to optimize, basically. So, mm -hmm. so this is more like a meter parameter then? Uh, yeah, something like that. Thing yeah. or so? Okay. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, so uh, indeed, take it, yeah, for that, if you encounter this, um, maybe that helps you out a little bit. Um, yeah, speaking of which, uh, especially when it comes to uh, machine learning based force field, usually you have to deal with some meta parameters of some sort. Um, is there any functionality in params uh, regarding that? Or is there any plans to add such functionality? Uh, so, so you mean, for example, optimize force fields for different values of, of this upper taper radius and then yeah or let's say when when you have some neural network based potential or the like uh from usually in the machine learning courses when you do something like that you see also uh entire optimizations of uh, meter parameters or so let's say nodes in a layer the amount of layers things like that right or, or even worse you optimize param hyper parameters for the optimization algorithm and so on yeah um, yeah, this this we don't we don't have. You can you can of course script it with the parent Python library uh, if you want to do it manually. Uh, but yeah, we don't we don't have it in, in parents at the at the moment. Like, like in the in the graphical user interface, we don't. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good thing to keep in mind for someone in the future uh, to to be able to make these plots as well, right? So from, to see whether your hyperparameters, meta parameters are converged. Um, or for bigger optimization pro projects or the like. Um, one more question. So when initializing a force field, can I select the force field uh, saved in a not default folder? So yeah, yeah. you can comment on how to start or load the starting parameters. Select any file. Great. That will bring up the file dialog to, to select your force field. And that should do what you want, hopefully. Uh, not loading, initializing. Um, isn't that the same thing in that case? So uh, you, you mean different parameter sets, Dogming? Or like different, uh, basically starting with one form of a force field and then assigning different values to it or so? Yeah. So let's say you have one form and then you get the, the actual values for the, the parameter set from somewhere else. How would you do that? Is that possible? Uh, I mean, if you have the values, you can just enter the values, right? So you, can, mm -hmm. you, can, you can change these to, to what you want them to, yeah. to be. Is that the question? I think so, yeah, but have, having some automatic way of doing this, or automated way of doing this. That is not, so So the parameters are not already in the force field format. They, they are something else in some other format. Is that the... um, in the oh. tutorial. Uh, not sure what you mean. Sorry, Doming. Um, what the... 
we can highlight some lines of blocks, yes, and then uh, you can change them out or so. Right. Uh, so, for example, if I select this uh, hydrogen oxygen bond, mm -hmm. I can do parameters and I can initialize this block. Mm -hmm. And then I can say these are now all the bonded parameters between hydrogen and oxygen, and I can say, I, okay, I want to initialize them from some other force field with hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. and so then, this this is probably what, what you mean then, right? Don't mean. And this will get you the, a list of all the force fields that have hydrogen oxygen parameters. Mm -hmm. And then you can click the one you want. Yeah. And exactly. that will then import those parameters into mm -hmm. this current force field. Correct, yeah. So that's also what he writes then to uh, the params is automatically searching that block. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you should then be able to also get that from a not default force field, the same thing? That was the yes. question. Yes, yeah, okay, that got... was the question. Now I right. get it. Perfect. Uh, yes, but you now first need to generate the database uh, to search, and then you need to include that, and that you need to go through the Python script to do. Uh, mm. so, so if you want to know how to do that, it's probably best to send the question to support and we will mm -hmm. sort that out and probably also add how to do it to the documentation because I don't think it's, yeah, it's not very probably. clear at the moment how to, how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you are familiar with the, the layout of the um, our executables, or our binaries, then you should be able to copy those force field files if they're in a proper format into the atomic data folder, update the uh, table of content file there, and then it should pop up, I would assume, right? Which is a bit no. Of, uh, no? No, because the the database is, is, yeah, that will not work. You need to generate the database, and then you need to scan those uh, mm -hmm. force fields in that directory. OK, so this is done by params, basically, when at the moment when it's installed. This, this kind of yes, thing exactly. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. OK, uh, yeah, so these are all the questions so far. I think that was a pretty neat discussion as well. Um, yeah, so always happy to see that. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone for being here. Um, thanks, of course, to Mati very much for yeah, presenting. Uh, thank you. Enlightening us today. Um, yeah, and to everyone else, uh, the next session will be coming up at May 19. Uh, so there's a little bit of a break, which is mostly because uh, people were just not available. Uh, but I hope to welcome you back then at May 19 for the next session, the fourth one of Amazon Science 2022. And yeah, until then, I said um, you should be able to download the recordings uh, we will so I put the I send out the link uh, regarding this YouTube playlist uh, yesterday and we will continuously add the videos as the recordings become available uh, also with the subtitles that will take a few days longer but we now figured out a way of how to do that um, and yeah with that being said um, I hope to see you again oh there's a question of, will we get a certificate? Um, sure, if you are able to attend all the sessions and if you let me know, just drop me an email maybe uh, what exactly you need there and then I will talk uh, among our colleagues how to, how we realize that. Is that okay for you, Masood? Okay, good. Then I will hear you later. Yeah, with that, um, Thanks to everybody once again. Uh, hope to see you again soon and I wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.